Is Blur Exterminator good? And more importantly, is it better than Deconvolution? In my opinion, yes, but it may not be for some of the reasons that you expect. So as a background, what is Blur Exterminator and what is Deconvolution? Blur Exterminator is a new AI-based deconvolution program that was recently put out by Russell Croman. I use a lot of his programs in my astrophotography workflow, so this one piqued my interest a great amount. And what it is, is an AI method of deconvolution where an AI is trained basically on space telescope data like Hubble and James Webb. And the AI basically knows what deep space structures look like. It knows what stars look like. And it can estimate the point spread function from your image and deconvolve your own images in a more intelligent way. In order to use Blur Exterminator, all you need is PixInsight and the process of installation is quite simple. You only need to go into the resources tab, add the repository link, update PixInsight, and then input your trial registration information or your license information, and that gives you access to the program. So in order to understand a bit more about what this program is doing and how it compares to deconvolution, you have to understand some things about deconvolution to begin with. So what deconvolution is, is a process of signal separation. So I like to think of it like this. You have coffee and you have milk. You mix the coffee and the milk together, you get milk with coffee in it. If you want to undo that process, you can't simply remove the milk out of the coffee. There are two signals that have been mixed and they're very difficult to separate. And that's what the idea of deconvolution is, is to separate the atmospheric and the optical aberration signals out of your data, which should be only clear images of space. Now, the way you estimate what is bad signal from the good signal is the process of estimating the point spread function. Now, estimating the point spread function is actually an incredibly difficult problem, and it's, it's just highly complex. It varies throughout subframes. It will vary throughout the different parts of the image. It's different for different telescopes, and it can actually be really difficult to estimate how your images are being corrupted by either the atmosphere, the optics, or the tracking. It's a very difficult and complex problem to solve, and it's one that is well-suited to being solved by an AI-based model instead of a simple fitting model. So the way that deconvolution works before Blur Exterminator back in you know the olden days is you would estimate the point spread function from your image by looking at the stars. Now a star out in space is so small it's resolved as a perfect pinpoint of light and as it's going through the atmosphere and through our optics it is no longer a perfect pinpoint source of light. So we can use the stars to estimate what a PSF is and use the statistical analysis to try and recover the original details from the image. Now this is a pretty good process, but it's very difficult to tune. It requires a lot of iterations, and it's just quite difficult to learn and get your head around overall for a beginner. Now Blur Exterminator helps to solve a lot of those problems and even goes a step further in a better form of point spread function estimation, which we will get into now. So I'm gonna quickly demonstrate to you the settings of Blur Exterminator and how it actually functions in PixInsight. So what I have here is an example image, a quite simple example image of just the Crab Nebula. This was captured with a CDK24 telescope and it's binned at two by two with a 6200 mm type sensor. So this is a pretty good example of an image where deconvolution is practical and where we can compare the results directly with Blur Exterminator. So just to start out with, I have the process loaded up here on the right, and you can see we have a number of tunable settings. We can adjust stellar features and non-stellar features. So essentially, this AI is capable of distinguishing between what is a star, what isn't a star, and what is actually a structure of a nebula, a galaxy, or whatever it is out in space. So this makes it really easy to actually deal with things like ringing artifacts and over deconvolution on sharper structures. It's, you know, it's going to be a lot more intelligent dealing with that. So the problem of masking an image kind of goes away when it comes to deconvolution. Anyways, we have the option of enabling an active preview or real-time preview to show what this program is doing in real time and actually tune our settings, which isn't something we get the option to do with in deconvolution. So that's a definite step in the right direction. So enabling this preview will just show us really quickly what this does to our image. 
Now, right away, you can see there is a big change. It is quite a bit sharper. The one thing, so here we can kind of demonstrate what these settings exactly do. Now, st for stellar adjustments, this basically just changes the size of our stars and how we want to control them. For wider angle images, it's not practical to really sharpen the stars too much. You might want to keep that more reduced, but for a long focal length image like this, it can have a really significant impact. So here it turned all the way down and then we'll crank it all the way up. And you'll notice that is an absolutely massive difference, huge. And it'll be a lot different than deconvolution as I'll demonstrate in a bit. So that can basically change the size of our stars. We can also adjust the halos with this slider as well if we see any kind of a ringing artifact popping up. So obviously like this is too much, this is adding a bit of glow to our stars, but we can index this slider should we see any kind of ringing artifacts, which can occasionally happen anytime you do any sort of deconvolution. So this gives us a way to tune that parameter a lot simpler than just tuning the, the global dark and global bright parameter in the normal deconvolution. So the next section, of course, is the non-stellar adjustments. So this is basically going to be touching all of the nebula inside of the image, which is the most important part. So for the non-stellar adjustments, you can choose to automatically set the point spread function, and that's what I'm doing in this case. I recommend you just leave it there. And you can also decide how much you want to sharpen objects that are not stars. So cranking this all the way up, it's gonna do a lot to the Crab Nebula in this photo. As with everything in image editing, I recommend you don't go full beans on any kind of editing process, but you can see it just it absolutely sharpens the heck out of this image. So I would prefer to go with a slightly lower value. This is either way, a really amazing result in almost no time, especially compared to the deconvolution process, which I will demonstrate for you now. Now the old way of doing things is we would go into scripts, we would go to render, we would go to PSF image, and then from this, we would attempt to statistically measure our PSF, and automatically I'm already having a problem because it can't find any stars. Tuning the sensitivity, now we found some stars. So there's a flaw right off the bat with the, the other processes. Finding stars to estimate a PSF from and trying to figure out if you even have a good PSF to begin with. Again, no stars found. We're gonna do this the even older way now. We're gonna go into dynamic PSF and click on stars because we're already having a bunch of problems. So now I'm clicking on stars to try and estimate what the PSF is. And you can tell this is just a big pain in the butt and I'm probably not gonna be doing this ever again. And we hit the camera, boom, that's our PSF. So this is what PixInsight has decided our blurring function is. We gotta go all the way over here to deconvolution we're gonna grab our external PSF. We're going to hope our parameters are great for de-ringing, but we'll see. All right, there is our first result from deconvolution. Obviously our parameters were not great. This is the frustration that this program solves. Tuning the de-ringing and all this nightmare type stuff, that's really difficult to do. It just solves it all. So there we go. That is an over deconvolved image with not enough ringing. So now we have to kind of go through and hunt around for a proper global dark parameter to fix this ringing halo effect, which props up from the old deconvolution process around bright objects or bright stars. And the old ways, you would always have to tune this and try and solve it. Now our global dark is better for the stars, but you can see it's overfitting. It's, it's way over convolving on the bright details in the object. We're gonna have to drop down our iterations or drop down our ringing even more. This result is just not a good time. All right, that's something closer to what I would expect from a decon process in PixInsight. So just comparing the two, one to one. The amount of time it took, the amount of complexity, it was just a lot simpler to use BlurX, in my opinion. So just comparing the results one to one, it took us way less time to get a good deconvolved result using BlurX than it did for deconvolution. Now, this is a pretty simple example for images. I'm going to show you guys a couple more examples where this goes above and beyond deconvolution. And the main way that this is a big step up is that it can deal a lot better with non-circular PSFs, things like motion blur, things like defocus, as well as varying, varying PSFs that change across your image. So for things like tip tilt, astigmatism, coma, other kind of optical, optical aberrations, this is more robust in dealing with those things. And the reason being 
you notice how we measured the PSF in this image by clicking on stars. We had to use really simple fitting functions to try and figure out what that PSF was in the beginning. Now, if our PSF isn't really in reality circular or it doesn't fit a Gaussian or MOFAT distribution, then things really aren't applicable as a way to deconvolve our images. So we need to be able to deal with more complex PSFs and PSFs that aren't global. So this deconvolution process doesn't apply to things that change throughout the photo. So if our stars are different in one part of the image, deconvolution can't deal with that. It's only going to apply a blanket global PSF to the whole thing, which may not be the best for all parts of our photos. All right, so for those who didn't understand what I meant by a PSF fitting function or what a PSF is, this image will help illustrate the problems a lot more clearly. So a PSF can be very non-uniform in an image if you're using something with a lot of tip tilt or bad corners. So this is a great example image from my reduced Takahashi 106 refractor, which is very fast and I'm using a very small pixel camera on it, which means you can really see where the corners start to go bad in the optical system. And this gives you a direct example of why the, the deconvolution process of using one PSF throughout the whole image doesn't make any sense for some photos. So down here at the bottom, in the left, you can see the stars are more clearly circles. These would be fitted better in the Gaussian process as being, you know, a normal PSF. So you would expect the shape or the star shape to be a hump that goes up. It's normal, it's circularly symmetrical, so it's round, and it can be really easily modeled by a distribution function like the Gaussian or the MOFAT. The place where problem starts to crop up is you notice my football stars in all of my corners. These are not simple symmetrical circles. They can't be handled by a circular distribution. You know, if I deconvolve these with a circle, it's not going to make any sense. And that is one of the main benefits of having the ability to deconvolve or circularize all of the stars individually instead of just addressing them with one global PSF. So I'll compare this directly with the result out of Blur Exterminator, and we can see that we can actually handle some of these ill-fitted stars where deconvolution would have no idea what to do with them. Now we can handle the PSF as it varies across the photograph, which is really, really important for images like this. So I'm probably going to be deconvolving all of my wide angle photos now too using Blur Exterminator because beforehand I wasn't touching these at all with deconvolution because it didn't make any sense. I can't apply a PSF that matches the whole image from corner to corner, but with a PSF that varies across the photo, I can address optical problems that crop up. And this one of having bad corners or coma in your corners is a great example of where you can recover a lot of information out to the far corners, which is a problem for a lot of people using these telescopes with full frame cameras and small pixels. You aren't gonna have good corners most of the time because telescopes these days can barely handle the full frame sensors. So this gives us a bit of invariance to being able to handle these tilt issues in a better way. All right, so not only is it capable of dealing with varying problems in your photo from things like coma or astigmatism, it's also capable of dealing with other problems like motion blur, which is a very big problem for people suffering with bad subs from guiding. You have a chance to recover a little bit of your photo. Now this is a very tough example for any kind of deconvolution program because this is a photo I've captured with some field rotation. Now this is an unguided photo with a bit off polar alignment, so the corners of the image have a stronger amount of rotation than the other parts of the photo. And not to mention this, it's also captured from a reduced Takahashi, so it's dealing with the same issues as the other telescope. Now, typically, you would try to approach this with a motion blur PSF, where you attempt to you know, mess with the ringing parameters, try and find the angle, try to adjust the length of the motion blur, and you'll end up with a not-so-great result. On top of this, if you have field rotation, like in this example, it would be literally impossible to address this using the typical deconvolution, because again, the PSF is varying throughout the photo. If you were to apply a global deconvolution, you would be attempting to motion blur deconvolve in different directions for things that don't make sense. Like you could only 
correct in one direction, but here in this photo, you can see the motion blur is changing directions throughout the photo. So this is a very tough example to be able to handle in any photo typically. Now just running a light iteration of Blur Exterminator, you're capable of handling the variant PSF throughout the photo that changes with the coma, with the field rotation, and you can return some of these stars to a closer, more circular result without having to measure the PSF or do any complicated processing. So this is another really powerful example if you're dealing with motion blur, field rotation, those kinds of optical artifacts, even in wide field systems. This is going to address those problems way better than anything has ever in the past. So this is a really great tool and it's unlocked some capability that really hasn't been available ever in the past. So that was a quick overview of Blur Exterminator. As an overview, the reasons why I think that this is an important program is one, it gives a reason to actually apply deconvolution to shorter focal length telescopes because you can address optical problems like field rotation, tilt, coma, astigmatism, and all these things that you couldn't actually address before with any kind of deconvolution. The other reason is that it is a lot faster to tune and use than using deconvolution for long focal length images. So it's just a faster way to do it for long focal length images and it actually gives you a reason to do it for the short focal length images too. It's a very useful program and it's one that I'm going to start incorporating for a lot of my own photos. So I'm gonna leave you guys with some before and after images now and uh, if you want to check out this program, the, all the links for it will be in the description, so you can check it out there. And yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed the video and I hope you find this helpful.